sure you take the right door on your way down. There's no telling where you'll end up. Can you make it through? To the night's end. you here now, friend. Maybe with both of us we can get into this room. The door appears to be made out of stone. And look around its edges. It's like Arabic. You wouldn't happen to speak Arabic, would you? Yeah, didn't think so. I know a little. Hang on, what's this? says friend in English. Hmm. What's that? Friend in Arabic, you say? Worth a try, I guess. <laughs> Sadiq. Wow. Great idea, friend. After you. Look at all this treasure. Precious stones of every size. More gold than anyone can carry. Though, if it's anything like the last room, the house wants us to look at the item on the pedestal. It's a signet ring. Look at the size of that ruby in the center. How intriguing. I wonder what this story is about. Hopefully not reanimated corpses. <laughs> oh. The Magic Apple Written by Matias Travieso Diaz Narrated by Victoria Irwin I am by nature a cautious man, Amir Zamar Ibn Zakran repeated to his vizier Abdur. This plague that afflicts us knows no rank or title, and I feel as vulnerable to it as any of my men. I need to make sure I don't get it. Insha'Allah, replied Abdur. You are in no danger in your quarters. Every room is kept scrupulously clean, and no filthy creatures can gain access to you. You are as safe from infection as we can make it. Yes, but... Samar drew breath shakily. It's not only my fate that is at stake. The army I lead is ready to move west to redeem Egypt for the true faith. If I falter, who will lead them? Despite all precautions, the plague caught up with Zamar. It started out with a fever that would not yield to cold compresses and baths in frigid water. The fever was accompanied by headaches and fatigue and multiple body aches. The second day, diarrhea and vomiting added to the symptoms. Samar realized he was infected and in mortal danger. He summoned Abdur and demanded, You must find a doctor who can arrest this curse. Don't come back unless accompanied by one. Abdur knew his own life might be at stake, so he left on his errand. Meanwhile, Zamar's condition continued to deteriorate daily. One morning, Zamar was semi-conscious, so he did not notice at first the arrival of two men. Abdur and a stranger dressed in black robes. Abdur approached the bedside. Sire, with me is Maharuf bin Kahab. He is a sorcerer who practices seer in the city south of here. Zamar reacted sharply to this. Seer and all forms of witchcraft are condemned in the Quran. Why is he here? Sire, I found no practitioner of the healing arts who knows how to deal with the plague. 
However, Maharuf here thinks he might be of assistance. And what is your plan, Maharuf? Lord, I've come across a genie, a member of the unseen race of beings that are more than humans but less than angels. This genie is a kind spirit who has assisted me with many tasks. I propose that we summon him and see if we can get a magical cure for your malady. How can you contact him? He is bound in a gold seal ring which I always carry on my person. Maharuf proffered his left hand, on the middle finger of which sat an oversized ring covered with graven names, symbols, and wards. All I need do to summon him is rub the center of the ring. Why don't you do it? asked Samar, who was beginning to lose consciousness. I shall presently do so, but first I must give you a warning. What's that? interjected Abdur. My master is dying. We have no time to waste. Abu al Sa'ahadat, that's the name of the genie, though I call him just Abu, will obey any commands that would have him perform physical tasks. However, er, he will not carry out any forbidden or abominable acts. Other tasks he may consent to do, but only as part of a bargain in which he has offered something he wants. Never mind, please hurry. Maruf rubbed the center of the ring and the room filled with a dense vapor which slowly condensed into a dark figure, a vast shape vaguely human. It had twisted legs like a goat, one of them lower than the other. Huge genitalia hung from his body, which was covered with coarse hairs, and red vertical eyes gleamed fiercely in the middle of a misshapen head. His hands were oversized and had only four fingers, lacking thumbs. It stank of sulfur, filth, and corruption. The apparition announced itself in a hollow voice. I am Abu al Sahadat. I am the slave of the seal ring, standing in the service of him who possesses it. What can I do for you, master? Maharuf responded, Hail Abu, I summon you today on behalf of Lord Zamar bin Zakran. As you can see, Lord Zamar is gravely ill, and there is no known cure in the human world for this malady. I call upon you to search in the hidden spheres for magical remedy that will restore him to health. Abu turned his fiery gaze upon the prostrate figure. Human, I am not bound to render you any assistance. What would you give me to help you? In a voice that was a mere whisper, Zamar responded, What do you want? I can get you riches, beautiful palaces, vast domain, fame and honor. What would it take for you to agree to help me? Human, the riches of the earth mean nothing to his jinn. We do not care for your palaces or your cultivated lands. And what honor can you bestow upon us who are superior to humans in every way? Zamar fell into despair and had no more to say. At this point, Maharuf turned to his slave and asked, Abu, are you married? In all the years of our association, I've never heard you mention your wives or children. No, I am not. Why is that? The genie waved his massive arms above his head, as if in lamentation. The genieri, the females of our kind, find me repulsive and will not couple with me. Maharuf had asked softly yet another question. Would you like the company of a human female? I have never contemplated such a union, yet it is known that humans and jinn have gotten married and have had children as a result of their coupling. Abdur cut in the, on the conversation. Would you agree to help our lord if he can provide you beautiful females for your pleasure? I have lived many hundreds of years and yearn for companionship, even from a human. Abdur walked over to Zamar's bed and shook him back to consciousness. Sire, would you be willing to offer human maidens to the genie in exchange for his help? Of course, how many slaves does he want? Abu responded to the dying man in an offended tone. I am sultan over two and seventy tribes of jinn. I will not couple with a human slave. It would have to be a free maiden of high birth. The genie's words unwittingly brought to Zamar's mind an image of his favorite daughter, Munis. She had just turned 16 and was exceptionally beautiful. It is well known that the genie can read minds if they choose. Abu fixed his burning gaze inside Zamar's head and gasped. Yes, he roared. It is her that I want. Zamar uttered an animal shriek. No, not my daughter, never. Abu thundered back. Human, refuse me and you will be gone before night falls. Give me your daughter in marriage or die. Maharuf faced the genie sternly and commanded, Abu, I order you to assist Lord Zamar. 
without making ridiculous demands. We'll find some other fair maidens to your taste anywhere in the world, but you must save this dying man. Master, you know you can't order me to do this, and I refuse to do so unless your lord and I come to terms. Abu, I need only rub this ring twice in quick succession, and you will be consumed by the fire of the names graven on this ring. Obey me, or you will cease to exist. Do as you wish. I have lived a long life already. You shall not bend me to your will. The tense exchange was cut short from a sound from Zamar's bed. I'll do it, uttered Zamar in an agonized voice. Swear to it, shot back the genie. I swear by Allah the Most High, cure me and my daughter Munis shall be yours. Your bargain is accepted. I shall return. With that, there was a dull sound like a candle snuffer putting out a flame, and the genie vanished. In the next few hours, Amar's condition deteriorated markedly. He was bleeding through every opening of his body and breathing with great difficulty. Death is at his door, concluded Abdur. Maharuf was getting ready to depart when a noise at the back of him made him turn around. A cloud of dense fog had gathered at the foot of the bed where Zamar was at the point of expiring. I have returned, announced the hollow voice of the genie, and I have the cure your lord needs. Abu held in his hand an ordinary-looking apple, a little bruised, mostly red with an irregular yellow band around the stem. He brought the apple close to the face of the dying man, who inhaled its aroma and gasped. What are you doing? asked Abdur, alarmed. The genie replied, At the heart of one of the most desolate deserts in the world, there is an oasis graced by a magic stream. At the edge of its waters, a single apple tree grows. The apples from that tree are magic. Their taste cures sick persons of the most mortal diseases, even if the patient is dying. Eating one of these apples will restore him to health. Will the apple you are holding make Lord Zamar well? inquired Maharuf. Yes, but not right away. He is too close to death, and would not be able to eat the apple. But the very scent of the apple is magic, and will stave off the progress of the disease. I will return in three days to feed him the apple, and start making arrangements for my betrothal to his daughter. The genie then vanished. When Abdur visited his commander early the following morning, he found Zamar awake and in somewhat better shape than the day before. Yet Zamar was still prey to high fevers, chills, and retching. Abdur proceeded to recount the events of the previous evening and mentioned that the genie would return in three days to complete the cure and move ahead with the wedding. Zamar became agitated. Abdur, go find Ma'aruf right away and have my daughter sent to me. Munis was even more beautiful in person than the image of her that Zamar had formed in his mind. This morning, though, she was beset by worry. Dark circles under her eyes showed how little sleep she had enjoyed in the last few days. You called for me, father? How are you doing? A little better, my child. Please bring cushions over beside the bed and sit near me. We need to talk. Eunice did as she was bid and sat facing her ravaged father. This loathsome disease will probably kill me as it has thousands of my men, he started. I want to live to serve Allah and my caliph and spread the true faith throughout the land. I also would like to remain alive for many more years, for a conquering warrior enjoys many rewards in fame and wealth. He released a sigh of shame. For those reasons, noble and selfish, I did a terrible deed yesterday. I made a bargain with a genie risen from the depths of the abyss. I promised, in exchange for his returning me to good health, to give your hand to him in marriage. The genie accepted the bargain and is in the process of making me whole. Muna said nothing. The tears that streamed down her cheeks spoke volumes of her distress. At last, she braced herself against the edge of the bed for support and responded in a shaky voice. You are my lord and master. Order and I will obey. Zamar watched as hopelessness took hold of his beloved daughter. He searched for words of consolation and could only come up with vague reassurances. It's not all said yet. I may be able to find a way to save you from this fate. Munis got up and walked away from her father her shoulders heaving and her face twisted by desolation and grief. When Maharuf entered the sick room, Zamar asked, Sorcerer, in your work you come across dangerous creatures like Ifrits and Shaitans, isn't that so? Yes, my lord. When you probe into the depths of the unseen, you risk calling forth malevolent beings that wish to destroy you. 
How do you protect yourself against assaults from such beings? Adepts of the hidden arts often fashion themselves with an amulet as protection against many forms of spiritual evil. I've won such amulet which I wear around my neck. At this, Maharuf brought out a round object the size of an egg, which dangled from a silver chain. He took it out and handed it to Zamar. The talisman typically contains, as does this one, graven words of power and sacred names of our saints. In a small cavity in the center of this talisman, I have dropped a few grains of pure sulfur mixed with tar. The smell of the mixture attracts and binds genie, demons, and other fell creatures. How long would it take to fashion one of these talismans? Not long, my lord. A skilled artisan under the supervision of an adept like me can get one finalized in a couple of days. Zamar turned to Abdur and commanded, Give this man a purse of silver, and then to the sorcerer Maharuf. I want you to deliver into my hands two talismans like yours by tomorrow night at the latest. See that you have these ready on time, or you will face my displeasure. Maharuf balked at the strange order. My lord, I must warn you against taking any rash actions you may later regret. Thanks for your concern, Maharuf. Now get to work on my assignment. See you no later than tomorrow night. The sun was setting when a breathless Maharuf made his entrance into the chambers where Zamar lay. Zamar raised himself on his elbows and greeted the sorcerer eagerly. Do you bring what I require? Maharuf inclined his head respectfully, and as he replied, Yes, my lord, produced from his tunic two identical necklaces, which he proceeded to present to the prone warrior. Are you certain these will protect the wearers from attacks by the jinn? Yes, my lord, they have saved me from harm a number of times, but why are you in fear of such an attack? I will be meeting with your genie tomorrow, and I want to be protected in case things don't turn out as they should. But why would they? You have entered into a bargain with Abu. He would not do anything to hurt you. Perhaps, replied Zamar. In any case, I want you to come back tomorrow and stay with me until he comes. Turning to Abdur, he directed the vizier, take one of these talismans to Lady Munis and ask her to put it around her neck and always keep it there. Your wish is my command. Late in the afternoon the following day, Abdur and Maharuf sat near the bed where Zamar shifted restlessly. As in previous occasions, the air in the room suddenly became thick and darkened to be filled bit by bit by the presence of the genie. Abu was carrying the magic apple in one of his four-fingered hands. The genie addressed Zamar with courtesy. Greetings, Lord. I come to banish the ills that afflict you. He approached the bed and tendered the apple to the prone figure. Zamar tried to reach for the fruit, but he was too weak and his attempt failed. As he sunk back into the mattress, Abu's face registered surprise, followed by anger. There is a smell in your body that draws me to it. He then looked intently into Zamar's chest. What is that? If I come closer, I fear it will tear apart my essence. Zamar attempted again to reach for the apple, but Abu had already withdrawn to the far side of the room. Foul human, you have betrayed me. Zamar attempted to explain. We can't proceed with our bargain. My daughter shall not marry you. I was afraid you would react violently to the news. Violently? Do you think that I would dirty myself attacking a filthy human? This is my reaction. His hand closed on the apple and squished it into nothingness. Maharuf had been watching with sickening fascination as the deal between the genie and the warrior unraveled. Now he shouted, Abu, Abu al-Sa'adat, I am your master and command you to come forth and serve me. He was not getting an answer, so he rubbed the seal ring time and again. There was a flash, a loud explosion, and all of a sudden the room seemed empty again, save for three terrified humans. Years passed, the plague was finally over and the armies of Islam moved to occupy the near and far corners of Asia and Africa. Yet in the now deserted headquarters of the Levant army, one house remained occupied but barely inhabited. Munis had never married and had become a bitter old woman, prematurely aged from cares and pain. Her life was simple. She kept house, saw to her religious duties, and cared for her father. Zamar was the last person on earth still afflicted by the plague. The disease would never go away, forever causing fevers, nausea, diarrhea, and intense pain. Zamar and his daughter, separately and at times together, prayed to merciful Allah to end the old warrior's life, and thus his suffering. But the cells in his body, once reinvigorated by the scent of the magic apple, 
refused to die, clinging to the blind hope that soon the juice of the otherworldly fruit would render them sound again. You've been listening to the Night's End podcast, which is a production of Dissonance Media. The Magic Apple was written by Matias Trevieso Diaz. This episode was narrated by Victoria Irwin from the podcast Texas Slang for Crazy, a podcast about Texas and its unique and crazy identity. To check it out, head over to txslangforcrazy.com or search for it wherever you listen to your podcasts. Jimmy Horrors was performed by James Barnett. This episode was produced and edited by James Barnett. If you would like to get your hands on some Night's End merch, head over to www.nightsendpodcast.com forward slash shop. And as always, stay horrific, everyone.